Today's program is going to be presented by Dan Heaton. So we'll get started, Dan. Okay. Thank you very you much. All right. Introduce yourself. Well, yeah, I'll that. just uh, I'll just roll right into it. My name is Dan Heaton, and uh, thank you all for coming out tonight. And hopefully, uh, we'll uh, teach you a few things and entertain you a little bit. Uh, and talk about uh, Selfridge Air National Guard Base. Uh, started way back in 1917. I enlisted in the Air Force shortly thereafter. Um, enlisted at Selfridge in uh, 1984 when I was 17 years old and um, have been affiliated with the uh, installation on and off uh, since that time. Um, and I currently work at the base uh, on a full-time basis. I wear a uniform every day. Um, and uh, work in the public affairs office. Uh, did all this research on my own time because I just found the history of the Air Force to be really interesting. So uh, I talk about the Air Force during the day and I talk about the Air Force uh, in the evening too. So we're gonna dig right into it. This is, um, and I know this photo is a little light and, and I also know the word hangar is spelled wrong in this photo. <laughs> but, yeah, thank you. Yeah, there we go. Um, this is the earliest photo that I can find of uh, Selfridge Field, taken on July 13th, 1917. So the base was 13 years old, or 13 days old, when this photo was taken. It opened on July 1st of 1917. Uh, somebody put those words on there. I don't know how to take them off because I'm not techno technology savvy enough to take them off. But uh, as I said, this is the earliest photo that I can find of the field. Um, about uh, two weeks after it opened. The base uh, started in, in July of 1917. The country was getting ready to go into World War I uh, and there was a need for uh, military installations around the country and that's how Selfridge uh, came to be there. And here, 96 years later, we're, we're still there, still, unfortunately, still sending people off to war uh, as needed. This is what the base looks like today. Um, Lake, Lake St. Clair is right here, and this is looking from, uh, oh, probably North River Road is right about where my hand would be. The tower is right here. Uh, you can see part of the golf course. These larger aircraft in the front, these are KC-135s. They are air-to-air uh, -air refuelers, so uh, they're a flying gas station. If a plane from the U.S. needs to get overseas in a hurry for whatever reason, uh, these guys go up and give them gas. They can also be used for a couple of different missions, including a very important mission. They can be outfitted as a flying uh, hospital, essentially an uh, air ambulance. Uh, we do that mission at times. We take people who've been uh, injured in a variety of situations, including Afghanistan, and uh, take them either to Germany or back to the States, uh, depending on, on what their needs are. Uh, kind of hard to see, but underneath these uh, sunscreens, and there's one sitting out here, that's where we uh, park our A-10 uh, Thunderbolt II aircraft. They're called the Warthog. Uh, the basic uh, function of those, and we'll see a better uh, picture of that later, it's got a big gun sticking out the nose, and it's what, if you're a U.S. Marine on the ground, that is the airplane that you want flying over you. Uh, right here in the middle, there's some uh, F-15 aircraft. Uh, those are the Eagles. Um, and just so happens when this photo was taken, actually this photo was about two, three years old, when this photo was taken, there was some bad weather on the East Coast, and so all the uh, uh, planes from a particular base they had to go. They had to go find other places to be when the hurricane came, and so four of them came to Selfridge. Four of them go to a base in Ohio, and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So we had some visitors that day. And back here, you can see uh, this is this is the main uh, runway right here. So what I really want to talk to about today are uh, two of the men who who were influential in the creation of what we today call Selfridge Air National Guard Base. And that is uh, this guy, this is Lieutenant Thomas E. Selfridge. And he is the man whom the base is named after. And then on the right is Lieutenant Byron Hugh Jones. And he was the first commander of Selfridge Field, uh, flew the first plane at Selfridge Field and did a couple of other interesting things that we'll talk about here in a couple minutes. Tom Selfridge uh, was from San Francisco. He came from a very prominent Navy family. His uh, grandfather, Thomas O. Selfridge, was an admiral in the Union Navy during the Civil War. Uh, he did a bunch of, uh, uh, he commanded uh, three different ships uh, during, the, uh, during the Civil War, all for the Union Navy. This man is uh, uh, our Tom Selfridge's uncle. Uh, he also was an admiral. He served in the Union Navy. 
he served on the Merrimack, either the Merrimack or the, whichever one was the northern one, the Merrimack or the Monitor, I get them mixed up every time. Uh, he also, after the war, he helped uh, decide the course for the Panama Canal. So the Selfridge uh, family was a very important uh, Navy family. There were two uh, U.S. Navy destroyers that were named USS Selfridge in honor of the two men. This is uh, the destroyer that existed during the World War II era. That destroyer was tied up in uh, Hawaii on December 7th, 1941 when the uh, Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor happened. The uh, USS Selfridge was the only ship that was tied up to the pier that morning that was able to get underway, uh, pull out of the harbor, and shoot down a, uh, shoot down a Japanese aircraft. Um, there were some that shot a couple of aircraft down in the harbor, but this one was actually able to get out into the, into the open seas and shoot down a couple of Japanese aircraft. And basically what they did was during the attack, as sailors were running here and there and everywhere, they literally were pulling sailors off the pier and saying, you're in our crew today. And they got underway and uh, returned fire. So the Selfridge uh, name's pretty important in the US Navy. Here's our man, Tom Selfridge. Uh, this is what he looked like when he went to West Point. He graduated from West Point in 1903, tried to get into the Navy Academy and uh, when he was 16. Back in those days, you could get into the Naval Academy uh, at that young age. Was an alternate to the Naval Academy when he was 16 and got appointed to West Point the next year. He was in the same class as Douglas MacArthur, who was a famous general in World War II and also was a general in uh, the Korean War. And he comes into our story again a little bit later. When Tom Selfridge was born, Chester Arthur was the president, and there were 38 states in the Union. So we're going back a ways. After uh, Selfridge graduates from West Point, he graduates uh, about 20th or so in his class. So he's a pretty smart guy. He gets assigned to a base in San Francisco. As I mentioned, he's from San Francisco, so getting assigned to San Francisco is a really lucky thing for him, for the Army, and for the city of San Francisco because while he's there in 1906 there is a terrible and famous earthquake that happens in San Francisco and this man who is the commander of the West Coast uh, for the US Army, this guy's name is uh, Frederick Funston, he is a general in the Army, he won a Medal of Honor uh, in the Philippines in 1899 and he's the commander of the West Coast. His home base is in San Francisco. This is 1906. There's no phone line to the White House. There's none of that. So Funston just declares martial law on his own authority, sends the soldiers out into the streets to maintain order, and gives his order, uh, soldiers uh, permission to shoot to kill if they see any looters. He takes Tom Selfridge and puts him in charge of the docks during the day so they can bring supplies in off ships. And because all the landmarks in San, Fris San Francisco have been knocked down, he puts Selfridge in charge of security of the city at night because he knows his way around because he grew up from there. Mm -hmm. Selfridge does such a great job. He wins a, a medal uh, for his service in San Francisco. And the Army basically says, um, whatever assignment you would like, you can have. And Selfridge is at this point, he's a young man. He's about 24 years old. And he can't decide, you know, the world is now his oyster. He says, I, I can't decide what I want to do. Can I go back to West Point, be an instructor for a year, and after a year I'll tell you what I want to do. And the Army agrees to that. So Tom Selfridge goes back to West Point. While he's there, he uh, spends a little time learning German. He spends a little time uh, studying artillery. He spends a little time uh, do, learning this, that, and the other thing. He can't decide what it is he wants to do. This is in, uh, in 1906. In 1903, there were a couple of brothers from Dayton, Ohio, who flew an airplane. And Tom Selfridge says, you know, I think it would be really interesting to go to Dayton and just to hang out and just to spend time with Orville and Wilbur Wright and just to learn all that there is to learn about uh, flying aircraft. So he writes a letter to Orville and Wilbur, uh, those two guys there, and uh, let's see, <clears throat> it's, uh, Orville is in the uh, light, lighter colored jacket. He writes a letter to Orville and Wilbur, says, I'd love, love to come and just spend some time and just learn from you guys. Orville and Wilbur Wright invented the airplane for one reason and one reason only. 
they wanted to be able to sell it and make a bunch of money doing it. So the last thing they want is some agent of the U.S. government hanging around their workshop and figuring out all their secrets. So the rights say, no, Tom Selfridge, we, we want nothing to do with you. Stay away. Well, Selfridge is not a man who gives up easily, and so he writes a letter to this distinguished-looking gentleman with the beard. This is Alexander Graham Bell. About 30 years earlier, he had invented the telephone, and now he is one of many people who is trying to figure out how to perfect modern aircraft. How do, how do you get it up in the air? How do you turn it? How do you control it? And he's working up in Nova Scotia, which is where his family, uh, he has family property up there. And he puts together a, a group of young engineers, and they're all in their 20s, and, and, uh, and uh, Bell at this point is in his mid-60s. He puts together this young group of go-getters, and they form an association, and they start experimenting with different types of aircraft. And Tom Selfridge writes to Bell and says, can I spend time with you? And Bell says, please come and spend time with me, and together we'll work on this project together. Teddy Roosevelt is the president. He's real excited about airplanes. He personally approves for Tom Selfridge to spend time with Bell in Canada. Another man that joins the, uh, joins the group with Bell is uh, the gentleman in the cap. That's Glenn Curtis. He is known at the time as the fastest man on earth. Glenn Curtis is an engine expert. He had, he, uh, his claim to fame is he invented an engine, put it on a motorcycle that traveled over 125 miles an hour. It's the fastest anybody has ever moved in the history of the world to that point. Glenn Curtis showed up in Dayton, Ohio at the Wright Brothers shop and knocked on the door and said, I want to put my engine in your airplane. And the Wright Brothers said, yeah, we don't really want to share the profits, uh, hit the road. So Curtis ends up with Bell as well. So the, the guys are in uh, Canada and uh, they're, they're up in Nova Scotia and they're trying to figure out a way to, how do you control an airplane? How do you make it turn? How do you make it go up? How do you make it go down? We got to figure this thing out. And the young guys all want to make an airplane. And Bell says, no, no, no. We're going to make a kite and we're going to figure out how to make the kite fly. And he looks at the, the young men and he says, we need to strap somebody into this kite so they can control it. Tom Selfridge, you're a U.S. government employee. Uh, you've got good insurance. We're going to strap you into, this, into the middle of this kite on this lake in Nova Scotia in December. Nova Scotia in December, right? So it's, uh, you know, pleasant. Um, they strap him into this kite onto this floating platform. There's a string here that goes into the water and basically Tom Selfridge parasails on this kite in December, <clears throat> December, um, December 13th, wait, let me see, December 6th of 1907. Tom Selfridge goes for a flight in this kite called the Signet One. It is the first time that a member of the U.S. military ever flies. It's in a kite. So he becomes the first, uh, the first flyer in the military. Uh, he flies, he controls the airplane, he, or the kite, he tries to make it go left, it goes left, he tries to make it go right by turning his body, and it does what he wants. He gets so excited when he comes down, he forgets to let go of the tow rope, and he crashes and destroys the kite. But it's a huge success, because he wanted to turn left, and he could, he wanted to turn right, and he could. And so it's a, it's a huge success. So Bell says, we need to make more kites. We need to make bigger kites. And we need to put more guys in kites. And the young men say, no, no, no. We're, we're done with kites. We want to build airplanes. So each of the, each of the young men in the, uh, in the group is called the Aerial Experimentation Association, the AEA. They each make an airplane. And Tom Selfridge makes this airplane. It is called the Red Wing has nothing to do with the hockey team. This is about 25 years before the hockey team comes along. Tom Selfridge makes this airplane. It's called the Red Wing because they put red uh, material on the wings because they were hoping that it would show up in the newspapers better that way. <laughs> they take it out to the frozen lake in Nova Scotia 
and they fly it in March of 1908. It's flown by one of the other men in the Bell Group, a Mr. Baldwin. It becomes the first time that a Canadian flies. It's the first time there's ever a flight in Canada. And it's the first time a plane developed by a U.S. soldier takes to the air. So Tom Selfridge is, is uh, he's on the way. This plane flies a couple of times, uh, each time for less than a full minute, but they're beginning to be able to control the aircraft. And the, the next aircraft they make is called the White Wing. Now they've put white material on the wings because they hope that that will show up maybe better in the New York Times and other newspapers like that. Tom Selfridge flies the White Wing on May 7th in Hammondsport, New York, which is in upstate New York. He flies the aircraft for about one minute and three seconds. Tom Selfridge becomes the first U.S. soldier, the first pilot in the U.S. military. <coughs> so it's uh, the, the uh, Wrights are having a great success, or excuse me, not the Wrights, Selfridge and Bell are having great success. They're putting all, every time they fly, they invite the media out, the newspapers and the photographers come out and it's all over the place and meanwhile in Dayton the Wright brothers are coming unglued because they keep going out to Kitty Hawk in North Carolina and flying their airplane in private and they say we've done this first we own the patent we own the rights every time that somebody flies an airplane they should have to pay us royalties and the Bell group says ah you're full of it so the Wrights start to sue the Bells uh, and say, we've done all this first, and the Bells don't listen to them. They say, you know what, we think that uh, we think that everybody should be able to work on this kind of technology. Nobody owns the right to it, and the case starts going into court. There's a group in New York called the, Aerial, the uh, Aero Club of America. They say the first group that can fly an airplane for a kilometer and land it safely. We will give them $25,000, but we want to be able to come and watch it. The rights say, hey, we've done that three times already. And the club says, no, 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 no. Not you say you did it. We want to come and watch it. So Bell and his group, they, uh, they put together a big picnic, Fourth of July picnic in upstate New York. They build a special airplane. There's Bell and, and Tom Selfridge. They build a special airplane. It's called the June Bug, because they first tried it out in June. And this time they think it's got bug-colored wings. Still trying to get that good media attention. <clears throat> they make this airplane and they say, you know what, we're gonna have this big July 4th party. Everybody come, we're gonna have a barbecue, we're gonna have a picnic, and then we're gonna fly the airplane. And sure enough, that is exactly what they do. Uh, Glenn Curtis, the engine man, he flies the airplane, flies for a kilometer. It goes for 25, or uh, they win the $25,000. They get a big trophy. It's the first time anybody in America has ever won a trophy for flying. And Tom Selfridge is right in the middle of it. Selfridge is now by far the most experienced man in America in flying because he has been in a kite. He developed an airplane. He flew an airplane. He has been in the air for upwards of three minutes. He is by far the number one man. There is a picture of the June bug flying on uh, July 4th in Hammondsport, New York, July 4th of 1908. So Selfridge uh, knows a lot about flying and the Army has been watching all this going on and they think, you know what, maybe we need to buy some kind of aircraft. The world, everybody's interested in buying aircraft. We need to buy an aircraft. We don't know what we should buy. So they think, you know, maybe we need to buy a dirigible. And a dirigible basically is, is a blimp that has, a, it has a, a frame. It has a wooden frame on the inside of it. And uh, they say, we're gonna test out this dirigible in Fort Myer, Virginia, or excuse me, uh, yeah, Fort Myer, Virginia, which is right outside of DC. We're going to do some tests, and we need our most experienced man to come and check this out. So, Tom Selfridge, we're going to recall you back to active duty, and we need you to go up and fly this dirigible and tell us whether or not should we buy it, you know, if we buy it, what can we do with it, 
and you know it's the army so you know can we drop bombs out of it can we shoot the gun out of it I mean what can we do with this thing right so Tom Selfridge uh, flies it with a couple of other uh, military pilots and, and they say you know this thing this thing's pretty good and they, they figure out a way to um, to, to make a, but, a better propeller they put a propeller on it they get it up to about mm, maybe the equivalent of 15 miles an hour of, of speed and uh, Selfridge invents the, the or designs the improved propeller for it and they, they say to the Army, yeah, we need to buy this thing. Whatever it costs, we need to buy it. So the Army buys it for about $25,000 and Congress goes bananas. They say, you bought what? For how much? $25,000 is a lot of money back in 1908. So the Army says, oh, you know, what have we done? We got Congress mad at us. They don't like the way we're spending money. We need to take this thing on the road and show it around the country and show everybody in America how awesome it is that the Army has a dirigible. So <clears throat> they, they break it down. They put it in a box. They put it on a, on a, on a, a train car, and they send it out to Missouri because the Missouri State Fair the Missouri uh, State Exposition is going on in Missouri and they send uh, a couple of soldiers out there and they're going to send Tom Selfridge out there so he can fly it and everybody can see good job Army you just spent twenty five thousand dollars on a dirigible I don't know what you're going to do with it but it's really cool looking so Selfridge needs to go out to Missouri and fly in the dirigible but before he does that the Army says you know what stay in Fort Myer for a couple more days because we got this other type of aircraft we want you to test. We, we the Army, have invite, invited the Wright brothers to bring their Wright flyer out here. Here's Orville. <clears throat> We've invited them to bring their flyer out here and we, we might buy that too. And we need our most experienced man to get up in this airplane and fly it around a little bit and decide if this is a good investment for America. Wilbur Wright is over in Paris. He's got another airplane in Paris and he's flying that thing all over the place and the French army is looking at it and the Italian army is looking at it and the German army is looking at it and everybody's buying an airplane and America's thinking, oh, we're getting left behind. We got to have an airplane too. Mm -hmm. So Orville starts flying in uh, Fort Myer. This is the summer of uh, summer, fall of 1908. This is less than five years after the Wright brothers' first flight. So every day, Orville takes this thing up and he flies. One day he flies for 15 minutes. The next day he flies for 20 minutes. <coughs> Thousands of people are coming from Washington, D.C. and from Baltimore and from all around because they've never seen an airplane before. They've never seen anything fly before other than a bird. And so thousands, tens of thousands of people are coming out to see the airplane. And um, different soldiers are getting rides in the airplane. And, and the Army says, well, we think we want it, but we want, we want Tom Selfridge to get a ride first and determine if this thing is really worthwhile. So Tom Selfridge, we, we're going to put you in this airplane with Orville, and, and we want you to fly, and then you are going to be the deciding vote on whether or not we fly this thing. Now, we remember that just a year and a half earlier, Tom Selfridge had tried to be partners with the Wright brothers and they told him to hit the road. He is a defendant in lawsuits brought by the Wrights against the Alexander Graham Bell group because uh, the Wrights think that Selfridge and company are stealing his patents. And now here's old Tom Selfridge sitting next to Orville Wright and he's going to decide whether or not the government's going to buy their airplane. Man, can you just imagine? Orville is fuming and he's writing his brother over in France saying I don't trust this guy every time he looks at me he smiles and and Orville is just beside himself but there is nothing he can do because he's got to take this army test pilot up with him so they schedule a day to fly in September at Fort Myer Virginia and they have to cancel because the weather's bad. Back in, back in these days, the plane didn't fly more often than it flew. And then the next day, they have to cancel. And then 
So Monday they cancel, Tuesday they cancel, Wednesday they cancel, Thursday it's windy and it's it's the and Selfridge has to get on the train to go out to Missouri on Friday. He's got to get out there. If he doesn't leave on Friday, he'll miss the state fair and they won't be able to fly the dirigible. So Thursday they're hanging around, they're hanging around, they're hanging around, and finally just after five o'clock in the afternoon on Thursday, September 17th, 1908, the wind dies down just enough for Tom Selfridge and Orville Wright to take off in the plane. Now a couple things about this airplane that you might notice. Number one, it doesn't have any wheels. Uh, number two, this is actually the front of the airplane. This thing here is kind of like the tail, except for it's in the front. The propellers are in the back behind the two men. So here's the back of the airplane. The propellers are back here. Uh, they hadn't figured out yet which is the best place to put the propeller, in the front or the back. Still kind of working on that. Because it doesn't have wheels, essentially they put the airplane on kind of like a, kind of like a ski lift, kind of like a ski jump. And it would go along on its skids, and when it would get to the end there would be a little, a little lift so that you know, they could get up into the air. Well, Tom Selfridge uh, tips the scales at about 175 pounds, and uh, just <clears throat> about what I weigh. And he is by far the heaviest pilot that the, or excuse me, the heaviest, heaviest passengers that the Wrights have ever had. They have always picked the smallest, most uh, diminutive soldier that they could find to be their passenger because they're trying to make their airplane look good. Well, the Wrights figure, we got Selfridge on this plane, we better put a bigger propeller on the back so they can push us more. And there's actually two propellers one uh, here and one kind of back here. You can't see it really. But there's two propellers. The airplane takes off on the skids. It pushes up a little bit. Because they're brand new new propellers, they really didn't do a very good job of testing it out. And when it lifts up, one of the propellers brushes the ground and develops a hairline fracture. Selfridge and Wright go up into the air. They circle around Fort Myers once twice about the second time around the, excuse me the second the third time around they make about two and a half laps the third time around they hear a loud crack there's about 5,000 people here the people on the ground hear the crack the propeller breaks and the plane starts falling out of the sky Orville cuts the engine he tries regaining control they're about 300 feet up they try rega regaining control they go down to about 75 feet, Orville thinks he's got it, and then it just falls out of the sky and crashes and the plane is essentially destroyed in the crash. While they're up there trying to regain control of the airplane, uh, Tom Selfridge looks at Orville and says, uh oh, and those may or may not have been the last words of Tom Selfridge. They, they land. Uh, Selfridge may have regained consciousness for, or may have been conscious for a moment after he lands. Uh, there is a soldier who claims that he hears Tom Selfridge say, get this damn thing off my back. Um, if he did say that, those are his last words. Tom Selfridge dies on, as a result of this airplane about a hundred yards outside of Arlington National Cemetery, which is adjacent to Fort Myer. And right where he dies is the Selfridge Gate at Arlington. If you've ever been fortunate enough or unfortunate enough to be at Arlington Cemetery when there's a, a burial, the uh, caisson that brings in the deceased enters into the cemetery through, is brought in by the horse-drawn caisson through the Selfridge Gate. It's not a public gate, the visitors can't go through it, but that's where they bring in the deceased is through the Selfridge Gate. Selfridge is on the ground. Uh, they begin to uh, resuscitate him. As I said, there are numerous, numerous uh, media that are there. Uh, so there's a lot of photos of the day. This is the doctors attending to uh, our poor Tom Selfridge there. He has a cracked skull. He's declared dead uh, shortly thereafter. In this photo, he's being placed on the stretcher. And this photo, I include this photo in this, in this report, even though it's a double image. Um, this is this is 1908. 
Henry Ford hasn't started making Model T's yet. The primary mode of transportation in the Army is the horse. This is how early and what an innovator Tom Selfridge is that he's flying airplanes and the Army hasn't really gotten around to buying a lot of cars or trucks yet. So the way that they respond is, is on horseback uh, to the situation uh, and they end up carrying them to the post hospital because it's too bumpy uh, to, to bring them to the hospital in a cart. He, uh, he uh, is in the hospital for a couple of hours and uh, he's declared, uh, declared dead. Uh, he's from a prominent enough family that they send runners to the White House to inform the president personally that uh, Selfridge has died. <coughs> Orville Wright spends about six or seven weeks in the hospital. He's got uh, several broken bones, primarily in his legs. Uh, he eventually makes a full recovery. Uh, Orville lives in, into the uh, late 1940s, just long enough to see the advent of jet aircraft uh, before he dies. Uh, I think he's about 75 when he passes. The uh, death of Selfridge is front page news across the country. This is the Washington Post. Uh, cost three cents back in those days and you can see there's uh, all sorts of coverage about how important Tom Selfridge is to the country. Tom Selfridge is the first person in the world to die in an airplane crash. So he is first for many things. He's the first pilot, he's the first member of the military to fly, and he's the first person in the world to die in an airplane crash. And um, unfortunately he's most remembered for the crash rather than the things that he did before that. The next summer the Wright brothers go back to Fort Myer, they fly their airplane, they get a pilot, they get a soldier who's about 125 pounds instead of 175 pounds to be the passenger. They sell their aircraft to the Army for about $30,000 and it becomes uh, <clears throat> the first airplane in the U.S. military and that's a flight of it the following summer, the summer of 1909. So, uh, Tom Selfridge dies in September of 1908 uh, from a prominent family, but you know, that's kind of it. Pretty well forgotten about um, until events change in world history uh, a few years later, 10 years later or so. Which brings us to this gentleman, this good looking young man here. This is Byron Q. Jones. He is a cadet at West Point he, in his junior year at West Point, Tom Selfridge is one of his instructors. Tom Selfridge spent the one year at West Point. Uh, Mr. Jones will become the uh, first commander of Selfridge Field. We'll get to that in a second. He actually gets kicked out of West Point in a big hazing scandal. Uh, this is his picture in the newspaper when he gets kicked out for uh, hazing, which is uh, you know, physically abusing uh, underclassmen. He's kicked out for about a year and a half manages to kind of talk his way back into West Point, uh, graduates from West Point and becomes uh, an officer in the cavalry, which you can see the crossed uh, cavalry uh, swords on his uniform there. Spends a little time in the cavalry and then uh, the army starts putting together a flying squadron and he says, you know, that, that sounds great. Applies, applies to be put into the flying squadron and, and gets into it and, and turns out he is just a natural, just a natural pilot. It just comes naturally to him. He becomes one of the Army's first stunt pilots, which is, uh, back in those days, they didn't call them test pilots, they called them stunt pilots. So he sets all sorts of records. He's setting records for uh, the longest flight. He's the first person to fly a loop-to-loop -loop and live to tell about it. He's the first person to uh, intentionally stall his airplane and live to tell about it. Uh, there's one of his early aircraft. He tests out the first airplane that has machine guns on it, these big, Things on the side are big machine guns. This is in the summer of 1915, and he's doing all these things at the uh, at the flying station in San Diego. <clears throat> in the summer of 1915, the uh, U.S. and Mexico are in a very contentious relationship. The southern border is uh, not is poorly defined at that point, and uh, there is a number of incidents along the southern border and the army says the, the US government decides to send the army to the southern border uh, to defend uh, to defend the southern border. It's actually the, the first of three times in our nation's history that um, well more than that 
probably four or five times that the Army's been sent to the Mexican border. Uh, I actually was deployed to the Mexican border a few years ago during the uh, when George W. Bush was president, and that was that was kind of a hot button issue there for a while after 9/11. <clears throat> so Tom Selfridge gets sent to uh, Fort Brown, Texas. Excuse me, Byron Q. Jones gets sent to Fort Brown, Texas, which is the easternmost place in Texas. If you go any further east, you're in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, he gets sent uh, to the base there, and he's under the command of this guy, this is our old pal Frederick Funston. Uh, he is now in command of the army down in Texas. And he says, hey, uh, Jones, I want you to go up in, an, in the airplane and take this guy with you. This is, uh, this is Arthur Milling. Take him with you. Go up in the airplane. And I want to know where Pancho Villa, we have a picture of Villa? No, no picture of Pancho. But anyhow, Pancho Villa is down in Mexico. And he keeps coming up into the U.S. and, uh, you know, raiding into the U.S. and taking guns, taking ammunition, taking money, whatever he wants. So you guys go up in the airplane and uh, figure out where Pancho Villa is and then let us know so that we can set up our defenses accordingly. So uh, Jones and Milling go up in the airplane. They've got a pencil, they've got a paper, um, and they've got an airplane. And that is their entire uh, outfit. They go up in the air. They're flying about 2,000 feet. And Milling says to Jones, are there bugs? What are you hearing? Well, they are hearing the sound of bullets that are going through their uh, going through the wings of their airplanes, because the Mexicans are shooting at them from across the Rio Grande as they're flying around. <laughs> oh, Jones and Millings swear that they never crossed the Rio Grande. Sometimes fighter pilots say and do different things, <laughs> but they swear that they never crossed the Rio Grande. They are able to uh, fly high enough and far enough north that they get away from the Mexican bullets and they safely land, count about uh, two dozen bullet holes in the wings of their airplane. So Byron Q. Jones flies the first combat mission in the history of the U.S. military. <laughs> he flies it in Texas in 1915. So the first uh, combat mission happens inside of the state of Texas. But you didn't know that. And there's a historical marker that basically tells the story of that. That happened in uh, the summer of 1915, <clears throat> in April of 1915, uh, to be exact. Um, so af after that happens, Jones goes back to San Diego, uh, does some more training. They're trying to figure out the best way to use the airplane for military purposes. Um, in 1917, the U.S. government decides that they're going to enter into the First World War. Uh, the First World War has already been going on in Europe for about three years at this point. Uh, basically, it's Germany against France and England. That's the short version of it. And the U.S. decides it's going to enter into the war on the side of France and England. At the time that the U.S. entered World War I, the German army had more cooks. There were more cooks in the German army than there were men in the U.S. Army and U.S. Marine Corps combined. So they had more cooks than we had soldiers and Marines. So it's, it's all hands on deck. We got to figure out a way to build up an army. And you know, while we're at it, maybe we should build up an Air Force too. And who are we going to get to train our Air Force? Well, we're going to get our most experienced combat pilot. We're going to get our old pal Byron Jones here, and we're going to send him to Selfridge Field, the brand new military base in Macomb County. And he is going to train pilots for World War I. He is the most experienced combat pilot in the U.S. military because he has been shot at one time. And so he's obviously the logical candidate to teach everybody how to be a combat pilot. <clears throat> he comes to, uh, comes to Harrison Township where they open the base. A gentleman by the name of Henry B. Joy, who uh, uh, operated the Packard Motor Company, was the principal owner of Packard Motor Company, uh, Packard Automobile Company. He owned the property where Selfridge is now, where the principal part of the base is now. He owned that property. He was running a little, his own little private airfield there. But you know what? It was real swampy. It wasn't very useful. It was below sea level. It, it, it was kind of, it was a lot of mosquitoes out there. And he leased it to the government. What a 
genius stroke. <laughs> so the U.S. government takes over Selfridge Field on July 1st, 1917, and by two weeks into it, you can see that they have already started construction. This is uh, photos from July 13th of 1917. On July 16th of 1917, and there's no photo of it, but Jones gathers all the men on the base, all the, pilot, all the men who are going to be pilots. He opens up the box, he puts the airplane together, and then he takes it for a flight to show them how an airplane flies. <clears throat> There's so many mind-boggling things about that little story. First of all, he put together his own airplane, which is just mind-boggling in today's military. But at the time, the pilots had to know how to do that kind of thing. The other thing about that was the people that he taught were all white men. And, and we have a lot of problems in our society. We haven't reached the final goal, but we've come a long way from that being all white men. And we, well, enough said about that. That's my political statement for the night. So uh, Jones uh, spends uh, the first uh, six months or so of the war at Selfridge Field. <laughs> Uh, they end up training about a thousand pilots, about 750 gunners to fly with the pilots. Uh, they get their initial training at, in, at Selfridge and at other fields that are opening around the country. And then they get shipped over to France. They get about a two week finishing school in France and then they get sent to the front lines. After uh, Jones gets uh, Selfridge started, he's there for about four or five months. They send him to France to run uh, the finish, basically the finishing school. So you'd get kind of your uh, uh, freshman, freshman, sophomore, and junior year and half of your senior year at Selfridge Field and get, get your graduation papers uh, w once you got to France and then right into combat you went. This is a parade down uh, Main Street in Mount Clemens. Uh, this is the Victory Parade, World War I Victory Parade. They carted an airplane out from the base and they marched down the streets of Mount Clemens. After the war, the Army says, you know what, Selfridge Field's a big swamp. We don't want it. And the people of uh, Mount Clemens, uh, bless them, said, you know what, we want the air base to stay there. It's probably the first of at least a half dozen times where the people of not only Mount Clemens, but really the metro Detroit area rally and say, you know what, we think having a, a military base in our community is, is the right thing. And we want to support that. And so the base is obviously still there today. Billy Mitchell. He is by far the most uh, famous uh, uh, early leader in the uh, history of the U.S. Air Force. His big claim to fame is, is he wanted the Air Force to be its own thing. He didn't want to be under the command of the Army. He wanted the Air Force to be its own thing. He wanted to have, they wanted to have their own uniforms. And the pilots didn't want a bunch of ground pounders telling them what to do. And he was so vocal about it, he eventually was court-martialed for insubordination and uh, drummed out of the military. Byron Jones was, uh, was uh, a protege of his and never forgot what happened to Billy Mitchell. And Byron Jones spent the rest of his year believing that the ground army should be in charge of the Air Force. He continues to believe that as, as we're moving towards World War II and uh, as we get closer to World War II, more and more of the people in charge of the Army Air Corps are pilots. They don't want to be part of the Army. They want to be their own thing. They are, they are tired of Jones saying, oh no, we need to be under the control of the Army. They eventually say, you know what? You need to go get a desk job in Washington, D.C. You're not in the Air Corps anymore. And so they find him a desk job, and he gets put in charge of acquisitions and uh, acquisitions uh, acquisitions and plans. By now he's a colonel, he's got a desk job in the Pentagon, a brand new building, and basically he's going to shuffle papers until his career is over. It's getting to be the late 1930s, some forward thinkers in the Pentagon can see that there are storm clouds on the horizon again. We need to start getting ready. We're going to need some vehicles this time because we still got an awful lot of horses. We don't have any kind of way to get around. We need a general purpose vehicle. We need a vehicle comma GP. We need a Jeep is what we need. And so the Army 
has a contest, invites all the automakers to develop a Jeep, and the winner of the contest is a little company in Ohio that maybe on a maybe if they're lucky they can build about 50 Jeeps a year. And the Army says, well, we're going to need a lot more than that. So the Army takes possession of the copyright and the trademark for the Jeep, and they say, we're going to take control of this and we are going to uh, lease back to you the right to build it. So Chrysler and Ford and all these other companies, uh, Willis, Overland, they make Jeeps. And they say, we're going to need somebody to run these papers over to the, uh, over to the Smithsonian and uh, claim the patent on the Jeep. And they look down and there's poor old Byron Jones sitting at his desk job. He's been sitting there for three years doing nothing. They say, uh, Colonel Jones, take these papers over to the patent office and file them. And so Jones does, and he is listed uh, down here as the inventor of the Jeep. <coughs> he never touched a Jeep. I, I'm sure at one point he rode in one, but he had nothing to do with the invention of the Jeep. But the first commander of Selfridge Field is single-handedly responsible for saving the Chrysler Corporation in the 1980s, based on his invention of the Jeep. That's my story, and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> So uh, Jones uh, serves, uh, serves in a variety of desk jobs, basically through World War II. He has a, a bad heart and uh, retires at the end of World War II. One of the things that Jones thought throughout the course of his career was that the, Army, the Air Force was best when it worked directly with the Army. He wanted the Army and the Air Force to work very closely together. He even was with a group of guys who were trying to figure out a way to use helicopters, and they just they couldn't make them work, and they were, the technology was too early for World War II. But Jones's idea was that that there needed to be a slow-moving aerial platform, a bench, essentially flying artillery that could work with the soldiers on the ground. And one of the aircraft that we fly at Selfridge at Selfridge uh, Air Base today is this A-10. Can't see it too well in this photo. There's a big nasty 30 millimeter gun sticking out the front of it. It carries bombs, it carries missiles, it carries all that kind of stuff. But the main thing is it shoots a bullet that's about that big. It's slow, it's slow, you can blow the wing off of it and it can still fly and land. And as I said, if you are a soldier or a marine on the ground and you are getting attacked by the bad guys, this is the plane you want over you. The last time we flew these in Afghanistan, the pilots said, you know, most of the time, we would come on the scene and we didn't even shoot the gun, we didn't fire a missile. All we did was show up and the Taliban or whoever the bad guys were would leave and our Marines or whatever would be safe. And there were times when they did fire the gun and saved a bunch of Marines. So the legacy of Mr. Jones uh, is really this aircraft and the way that the Army and the Air Force works together um, using this aircraft in combat. That is my story of uh, Byron Jones and Tom Selfridge and how they uh, worked independently really to kind of bring us uh, the start of Selfridge Field. Uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions you have about either of those gentlemen or, or the early history of the base. <laughs>